Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another video. I'm out here at um, Starbucks. Enjoying the view here in Ajman. And I just closed out a meeting, actually. So I. Um, I wanted to um, talk about everybody's favorite subject, which is money. Let's talk money. So what prompted me to basically do this video was a conversation that my daughter and I were having. We were talking about, you know, everyone talks about financial literacy and all of this stuff, which is basically knowing <clears throat> how to make good investments, property budgeting exactly, you know, <clears throat> smart investments, budgeting your money, not investing in things or buying and purchasing things that would exasperate or exhaust your resources to the end of that but you know basically the the muslim he puts his trust in allah of course we are encouraged in islam not to be spendthrifts not to be people who spend beyond our means you know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs us not to spend until your hands are stretched forth where the, you're going to be blameworthy and not to be so stingy and bakhil, you know, like a miser, whereas though you are afraid to spend anything, that's blameworthy. So, you know, we're in a balance in the middle course. But I explained to my daughter that I had gotten affected. I used to read, of course, a lot of business books because I've been doing business for years since I was young, since I was a teenager. Um, I, I took an interest in it. So I've always done some sort of entrepreneurship, even as a young person. So I used to read different books and I increased in the types of books I was reading um, as I became an adult. But what I realized was um, when I started to get into the books of the non-Muslims, it comes with a lot of philosophy, a lot of beliefs behind their money and what they what they believe about investments and projecting and trying to cross all the T's and dot all of the I's and prevent loss and those things, which is okay, but um, in some cases. However, the Muslim, you, everyone knows that there's no, there are no guarantees and um, whatever's written for you to happen is going to happen. And we're pleased with it all. That's what the beautiful thing, beautiful thing about believing in Qadr is that you have to accept it all. As long as the person knows they've done everything that in their power not to be irresponsible with money, if Allah takes it from you, that's what he decreed. If you lost it, that's what he decreed. You got fooled, you got scammed, that's something that was unavoidable, especially if you didn't see any signs. And, um, you know, nothing you can really do about it. However, I'm going to share some articles with you all in the, in the comment section. I just, like I said, the conversation I had with my daughter regarding wealth and poverty. I talked about the hadith. Prophet Sallam said, take care of five before five. So take care of your health before your sickness, your wealth before your poverty, you know, before you become poor, your life before death is not in order, of course, your time before you become busy, and your youth before you become old. And of course, the explanation of the hadith regarding the wealth before your poverty um, 
you know, the imams of the past, they explain the hadith as being take care of those religious obligations with the wealth. Your financial obligations, whether that is spending in sadaqah, preparing for the hereafter, you know, before Allah takes the wealth from you. Your hajj, your umrah, those obligatory, uh, your zakah, those obligatory things that Allah have placed upon us for the person who has wealth. Take care of that before your poverty. But I was just explaining to my daughter that poverty is not what the non-Muslims describe as poverty. Because they have a different terminology of what poverty is. Okay? And poverty in Islam, of course, fakr. It means you're poor. A, a, a man, the Muslim who has a big house, will be considered poor if he can no longer support himself financially for the whole entire year. That would make him eligible for the zakat. But the non-Muslim, they wouldn't consider that person poor because of what he has, of assets, quote-unquote assets. So if you own a house and you own a car, you know, but you have no cash, you can't spend on yourself, you're broke. They wouldn't consider you impoverished. But the Muslim, the, the definition of poverty in fakr and Islam is different. So people need to understand as a Muslim that if you don't have financial means to take care of yourself for an entire year, you're considered from the poor people and which makes you eligible to receive zakat. So I was explaining that to her that everyone visits poverty, everyone, even the rich. And I'm gonna show you from the articles that I send you because it's from the non-Muslims, them explaining themselves about their condition, um, it relates to how they're always worried and, and anxious about losing their money, how some of them go broke, how you, how they destroy their children by giving them everything if they themselves had grown up poor and then became wealthy by working for it or whatever. They usually spoil their children and sabotage them um, because they, they don't want them to, to, to suffer or they don't want them to have the same uh, problems that they had growing up or whatever the case may be so a lot of the times money is an emotional relationship with many people and it's connected to trauma and you know that's the psychology part of it every individual would have to visit that in order to free himself of an unhealth the unhealthy relationship and mindset that people have with money why they chase it all the time. And I'm talking about the Muslim, the Salafi. But everybody can benefit from it, of course. But this is something that's not visited that much. Um, you'll have, you'll have uh, Muslims who say, you know, they have an aversion to wealth. They have an aversion to it. They condemn people who have it. They say, they think that you're materialistic if you do have it. And it's not everybody, of course. But many people, because of them being Western, and it is a Western construct, to hate the rich. It's not a concept from Islam. You say the Muslims don't have that. Everybody, everyone knows that you need money in order to do everything. You know, fulfill your religious obligations. You gotta pay mahar. You need to buy land. You need to, of course, I'm talking about from the, from the material things that you have to do in life. You need money to get married and take care of a family. The Muslims from the Muslim lands understand that. And those immigrant children <clears throat> who have been raised in households where the parents, of course, come from the Muslim lands, they understand. But people who are born and raised and bred in the West and convert to Islam, the idea of money is connected to arrogance, right? They think that the rich people are arrogant and they come hand in hand 
that's the Western idea of money. And many people, when they do become wealthy, they do they, they get arrogant from those who are from the West because that's what they've been shown, that's what they know. And um, it's like they have a, a love-hate relationship. The poor have a, a love hate relationship with wealth. They would like to be wealthy, but they hate the wealthy if they're not wealthy. And then when they become wealthy, they become like the people that they hate. So that's very interesting. But um, yeah, in the Muslim lands, the, they understand. Everyone strives, they work hard, you know, and um, they get what they get. But the issue of it becoming your personality and your identity that's when it becomes unhealthy. That's when it becomes an issue where the person puts wealth first before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they believe that they don't have anything if they don't have money. And their happiness is surrounded around the fact that they have money. And their sadness is surrounded by the fact that they don't have money. Their happiness is if they do have money, and their sadness is if they don't have money. Okay? So I was explaining to my daughter again about everyone visiting poverty and corporations, big businesses, small businesses, you know, entrepreneurs, individuals who have small businesses, people who are extremely wealthy do inheritance or whatever, pass down wealth. Everyone, whether it's from accumulation, from investments, assets, everyone visits poverty at one point in their life or another, whether it's the beginning of their life and they had to strive for it to get money because they grew up poor or the middle of their life or several times in their life or at the end of their lives. But everyone visits poverty at one time or another. They are tested with wealth. There's no such thing as a person, even if it's, for example, they have assets. Because like I said, the non-Muslims, they have a different definition of what poverty is. A person will have assets, right? They have multiple properties. But what's the sense of those properties if funds have dried up? No one is running them. They're not running them out. If, for example, if you're in the real estate, you're not you're not getting any prospects to rent your properties so that means your cash flow is low and i've witnessed this myself being in real estate working for a particular owner who has multiple properties spread out across dubai and they give you a spreadsheet every single month of the properties that are available for rent and a year an entire year had passed by and this owner could not rent out his properties they just wouldn't go and he was baffled like i don't understand what's going on you you know um the agents need to work harder they need to you know advertise more they have to do something to get these properties rented out and these were these are expensive properties and even till now you know the, the, he started to some of them started to get rented but he still has a nice amount that are not rented so of course his financial spending ability is not the same as it has been over the years because some restrictions have come. You don't have as much as you used to. Those properties are sitting. So again, corporations, they have to cut back on jobs sometimes, the staff. They have to, uh, they don't have the budget for some, certain things. Sometimes they, if you're a uh, franchise, um, you have multiple stores, I'm sorry, you have expansions and stores across the country. You have to close some of them down to cut back on costs because some, some stores are not doing well and others, other locations are. It happens. You got companies, they file for bankruptcy. It happens. Those are levels of poverty restriction. Well, that wouldn't be considered poverty, but I'm just saying. Um, for example, if these individuals who have large money, they have a huge outflux spending that they have to spend monthly. And 
more money is going out than it's coming in. So they don't have the financial ability to spend the way that they used to for leisures. They don't have extra. So all of their money is going out. And you'll see what I mean by the article that I put in the comment section. It's about four or five different articles. And one is about an individual who's saying, I just don't have enough money. He makes a lot of money, but things have risen, prices have risen, and he has had to spend more of his earnings that now the only thing that's left is basically being able to eat and buy some essentials, but he's saying it's getting more tough and tough, and this guy has a lot of money. He's spending more than he's bringing in due to cost of uh, living expenses increasing. You know, he's spending on to maintain the assets that he has from the cars, which he doesn't really own. You know, mortgages and car notes and all of those things. So people need to understand, those of you who are on the climb, you're starting business, maybe all of a sudden you became wealthy, you need to know that wealth doesn't stay the same and maintain throughout the years. For those of you who do business, you already know that. Business is up, business is down. Everyone who's in business understands this fact. But if you are not around business people, you don't talk to business people, and you're new at it, or you're a working person and you're, try and you're starting business, then this is something that you'll learn. And unfortunately, many people are shocked when they're riding high and then things get slow and they're like, I don't understand. I don't, I, it takes a hit at their self-esteem as if they did something wrong, but no. It has nothing to do with you and it has everything to do with Qadr and what Allah decreed and that every single person visits restraints, financial restrictions. What they say, I'm asset rich and cash poor. So yes, that is, those are financial restrictions. That is a level of poverty. If you don't have cash, then in Islam, you would not have to pay the zakat because you don't have it. You can't, you can't afford it. Your expenses are large. Your, your family expenditures, everything is large. So you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have to pay the cat on any money because you don't have the money to pay the cat on. Regardless of what car you drive, regardless of the house that you have, it doesn't matter. So like I said, the Muslim has to understand what does poor mean in Islam and not the definition of what the non-Muslims say poor is right and um, I, I, sp I also t told my daughter that I understand the trials that I've gone through in life they actually help shape me and help me understand life because growing up I've never seen poverty and I mean, a couple of generations, like my grandparents, they weren't, they didn't grow up poor. Um, they were spoiled. My grandparents were spoiled. Therefore, they spoiled my parents. And I mean, on both sides, both my, my mother's side and my father's side. And then they spoiled me, of course. So learning these things you know in light of islam regarding money and how uh, you know poverty hits you and things like that it makes me understand many things regarding what i've been witnessing from the adults around me and subhanallah now that i'm an adult i've seen these same people who raised me fall on hard times and their mindset towards falling on hard times it takes a toll because they had never been through it before. So I'm like, subhanAllah, 
um, it's very interesting. You also see people's attitudes towards business. I'm talking about family members. If they were given their entire lives, when their approach to business is like, I want it to happen the way I want it to happen. If it's not successful by this particular time, they're going to quit. Why? Because in my mind, I should be successful in a year. I see other people. I see this. I see that. So they don't have the hunger. Why? Because at the end of the day, I can go to this family member, to that family member. I'm used to having so. I'm not going to be struggling. I'm supposed to be on top as soon as I start something. And many people's attitude is like that. But a person who's hungry or they're determined, me myself was hungry for Hydra. I never cared about money actually because it was never a problem in my life. So I was, it benefited me as it relates to religion because I was, like I said, I was able to marry people who were not wealthy because I was just looking for religion and not necessarily living according to a standard, I was able to learn a lot of lessons because for me it was just a trial. It was just a, I was trying something out. But I can go back to my real life. This is really not my life, so I don't care. You know, it's just something I'm trying. I'm not stuck like this. Yeah, so if you, you know, me, myself, it wasn't an issue for me, so I was able to bear some things in order to learn. I, I wasn't afraid of living poor because I've never done it before. And it was, like I said, it was an adventure for me, you know, going to Yemen and living rough. I was like, okay, this is interesting. But I didn't. what I didn't realize is that it was going to traumatize me, though. It definitely traumatized me because if you haven't experienced something before and you're with an individual who uh, makes it difficult, it wasn't a pleasant experience, um, you know, kind of like forced and, and mean, then you, uh, you do get traumatized, especially when the individual is not even reasonable. You get traumatized. So some things you just, you know, alhamdulillah, I, I, I made it out, but some things shouldn't be tried. I understand now why you're supposed to stay where you are um, financially. But alhamdulillah, Allah taught me. I, I, I did that adventure and I went on that adventure and Allah taught me. So I'm grateful at, at least I came out with some lessons and some knowledge and things like that and perspective. But I also talked to her about, talked to my daughter about people who are um, mentally poor. Like I explained, individuals who they think that, oh, when you get money, money lasts forever. You should be able to spend how you want, spend as much as you want. And in their minds, I'm never going to go broke. The money just keeps coming and it, it, it doesn't work like that. That's just not life. That's not, that's not life. It's not what Allah decreed. So, um, it would be of some benefit for individuals who have an unhealthy relationship with poverty, hardships in their past, in their childhood, and they cling on to money and it becomes their identity. I'm talking about the Muslim. And you change your personality and things like that, it'll be, it's, it's to your, it's your worthwhile to revisit those things and really analyze yourself in your mindset because when you when I me myself accompany people who are not used to having anything I've witnessed the mindsets I've witnessed people's behaviors and I'm like oh subhanallah okay that's what it looks like when individuals didn't grow up with anything you know they they have certain characteristics um, they have certain mindsets certain speech Allah mustan it's, it's a it's pretty hard to watch, you know? So um, if you have been someone who was blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be born in a family that assists you, helps you, and takes care of you, then you should be grateful, you know? If money is not an issue for you, you should be grateful. If you're not arrogant because you 
are used to growing up around people who have money, you should be grateful. But it's also your worthwhile to understand that hard times does it, it hits. And maybe your parents faced them, but you just didn't know about it. Um, and when it happens to you, if you're thinking that, oh, it shouldn't be like this, and I don't know what I did wrong, no, that's not correct. It's just your parents didn't tell you about it. They, they didn't talk to you about it, you know? Or maybe it didn't hit them yet. So just know that it's a part of life, and it's not the end of the world. And Allah will give you again, but you should be grateful for the time periods that he allowed you to have what you have and what you have had, you know? So the poor mindset is an individual who, like I said, he thinks money doesn't end. He just keeps spending and spending and spending. And then when he winds up not having any more, he's like, I don't get it. Why did it stop? What happened? I thought I was going to be, you know, I was going, this money was going to last forever. No, that's not how it works. If it's meant for an individual to be poor, he's going to spend up all of his money and be right back at ground zero. Have individuals who run through millions of dollars because they don't have what they say financial literacy. Well, they're not, they're not people who are used to money. So the very first thing that they do is they go and they buy things that they feel that the rich have. Material things, things that make you look good, but they don't make smart decisions. They're not business minded. So they don't invest well. They don't calculate well, account well for their wealth. They don't budget well. They just want to enjoy, you know? So they wind up broke again because that's what was meant for them. They have a poor mentality in the first place. A person who has a mentality of wealth, they're going to preserve. They're going to make smart investments. They're going to budget. They know that what they say, money doesn't grow on trees, that you can't just spend, spend, spend. Those are people who are used to wealth and are financially, what they call financially literate. I really don't like using that term. I don't like it because, like I said, it's a lot of things that comes along with those ideas. But, um, you know, I'm just talking about this because you don't really hear people talk about it. Just don't. The non-Muslims talk about it a lot because that's their life. Now, the articles that I'm going to share with you is the raw reactions and consequences of living for wealth and you have no God that you refer to or think you don't rely on the creator for your provisions so you have the raw results of hard work and Allah giving them according to what they work for but the flip side is all of the things that comes along with that. From not understanding when things get restricted, getting stressed or not trusting people, uh, thinking that people are only out to get your money, um, constantly in fear of losing your money. All of those things are a punishment for the individual who worships wealth. Feeling stressed all the time, chasing after the money and got to get more and, and feeling like it's never enough. The articles that I want to share, if you want to read them, you can see it for yourself. And Ibn Qayyim al Allah, he speaks about all of these things as it relates to the person who chases after wealth. That's why the other men make the statements that they, that they make. And of course, they're observing the Muslims who have that condition. So the results are the same across the board, whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim. You put wealth first, you're going to suffer from that. That was your main concern, you want to suffer from it. You want to develop ill characteristics if when you were on hard times, you didn't humble yourself and you weren't thankful for when Allah gave you. Or you don't praise Allah when he does give you. You praise yourself. You thank yourself, you know? Like I said, I want to do a series on business in light of, uh, you know, the Quran and Sunnah and Iman given this different scenarios to give you a clear picture of um, how we're supposed to look at things.
So I'm gonna leave off with this. These are our rules. These are my principles for uh, how I look at wealth and um, my relationship with it. And I told my dad, so I talked to my children. I, like I said, I don't like using that financial literacy terminology, but it's important to have a good attitude about wealth. Oh, there's another thing too, what I noticed. Individuals who visit hard times, I've noticed sisters who when they fall on hard times, after having money, their attitude towards it affects their children, which makes the children vow to say, uh, you know, they vow to never be in that condition, which Allah Mustan, that's, you don't know what condition you're gonna be in. But if you show your children that you are discontented and when they ask you for things and you can't get it for them and you're like very, very, very negative about it, they see that from you. They don't see you have a positive attitude. Thank Allah for what we have. We say, Alhamdulillah, look at all of the things that Allah has given us in the past. We have to be patient. And I'm talking about a person who they learn and they, they read. But when it comes to the trials, they don't put that knowledge into practice. And it affects your children. When you constantly have a negative view of your condition, you're looking for someone to blame, whether it's the father, you know, uh, for whatever happened between you two. And you're blaming him for you being in that condition that you're in. When he's in the same condition as you, <laughs> he's also restricted. So you want somebody to blame instead of accepting cutter. So you affect your children. And they have a bad, and a lot of people visit that. They have a seriously negative attitude towards not having due to how their family members made them feel or what the circumstances was surrounding why they have financial restrictions now. So you gotta be careful. And I would advise if you're visiting hard times, know that no hardship lasts forever and the law will give you again but you got to be grateful and you got to be someone who is productive you have to be someone that's willing to work because you have other individuals who like to rely on people in totality and they live their entire lives begging whether they're male or female always miskeen expecting other people to give for them give to them you have people who grew up with money who do that, once they, once they see hard times, they now expect other people to provide the lifestyle that they're used to. They become resentful. So they start asking people for money all the time as if they're entitled to other people's money instead of doing something for themselves. So like I said, those articles will give you some idea and some insight into these affairs, but everything has to be returned back to the religion, and we have to look at things in light of the religion, no doubt about it. So our rules are, these are my rules for life, my principles release to money. Know that all provisions come from Allah, that's first and foremost. To be grateful and give thanks in abundance or in restrictions. Right? When you're in abundance, when the law provides for you in abundance, pay yourself a salary and save the rest. In times of restrictions, lower your salary for yourself and spend less. Basically rationing. You gotta practice rationing. That's a lost art. When you don't have an abundance, you're not supposed to spend the same as you did when you had abundance. You want to deplete all of your resources. That's not intelligent. And it's blameworthy. All right, you gotta give sadaqah, of course, to purify your wealth. Live, always live below your means. Do business or invest in whatever field you want, but learn the market before entering into any endeavor, whether that is trading or, you know, you wanna open up a restaurant or whatever business endeavor it is, whatever field it is. You have to study it first, learn it, you know? And um, to work it all Allah. Yeah, put your trust in Allah. Whether it's uh, Allah decrees for you good or bad regarding your wins and your losses in business or trading. And that's basically the principles that I live by. And I show Allah someone benefits from this, you know. If you have anything to say or add to it, 
then leave your comments down below. And um, may Allah grant everyone to peak and success in their hijra. And don't forget the hijra mandate sacrifice. And I'll see you all in the next video. Inshallah. Ma'asalamah.